Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Lit RPG Audiobook Podcast. I am Ray, and today I'll be reviewing some... Hmm... Naughty Lit RPG Audiobooks. Some are recent and some are classic, but they're all for the Christmas season. Have you been naughty? We'll find out. Oh, and I'd just like to say to Charles Dean, I don't look like a Santa Claus-looking mother... Well, I won't go that far, but he's called me that. So I'm flipping it around and saying I'm not that way, Charles, just because I'm fat and I have a white beard and I wear a red hat. Okay. Okay. Well, anyway. (sighs) Anyway, today we are going to start with The Crystal Heart Enthralled, book one by Prax Venter, narrated by Christian Fox with a book length of 11 hours and one minute. Really? One minute? You couldn't just get a solid 11 hours in? Playable for 1% of one second. Just one in-game day. Then you can get to all that serious business you're planning. Okay, wow, Sasha. Touch me? He looked down at his numb, flesh lumps in his lap. They had played many virtual games together when he was younger, but life happened and he didn't have time anymore. He met a girl and was with her for four years, but they split up shortly after his accident. He hadn't played a game with Sasha in a long time. His old rig wasn't very good. It could do audio, video, and some basic sensations, but that was it. Tactile output was transmitted via interface gloves, which became depressingly useless to him after getting zapped. He looked up. What program is it? Have I ever steered you wrong before? I know what you like, Mark. It's something new and something that will blow your mind. So, I have to ask, how does this book stand out to the others compared to our naughty list today? And we've got a lot of books on the naughty list. A lot. Well, not a lot. There's, uh, there's, a, there's a good bunch of books, though. Um, anyway, there's a lot of books on here. But, but the way that uh, here that the sexiness works is that the main character, Mark, has a class that allows him to collect hot women who then fight on his behalf because he is a lover, not a fighter, literally, quite literally. I have to say that the book does have a few really good standout things for me. First of all, it is the biggest part that I enjoyed the most was the use of time dilation that I've been really waiting for. I mean, time dilation has been mentioned in a few other lit books, um, but it's never been used to the effectiveness that I think that this book finally brought us to. I think that uh, Enthralled really, really took the time dilation s- concept and just ran with it. And it, it's pretty innovative and it's ingenious in its use, okay? It added to the story by giving it a really horrifying element that also allowed for the MC to be in the game forever. And I mean forever, without dying of thirst or starvation in real life. Now, secondly... I also loved how Prax used the first companion as the impetus for all that follows. I don't want to give anything away, but it was a really nice twisty twist that I didn't see coming at all. I mean, the very, very first, first companion. Uh, And at first I thought it was we were going to be getting like a a feedback loop Groundhog Day style novel, and I'd have done something crazy with that. But no, I mean, um, no, that was not what happened at all. Venture was just too slick for my old neurons up here to kind of catch on to what was happening. So, nice job, Prax. Those two things alone made this book for me via creativity. I think that was really, really awesome how you did things. Now, altogether, there are a total of three, count them, one, two, three, uh, enthralled that wind up on uh, Mark's naughty list, I guess. Naughty harem, I don't know. Um, But there's three of them. Now, one is a Nyx, a killer kitty. Vale, a naughty naga, and Rue, a cloth-spun gal who has what I consider to be one of the coolest powers ever. I just love her powers and abilities. Um, Mark is given the task of repairing rifts in the world, the game world, and there was the ability to do so. And that is basically what the book is about, plus him growing his harem. So it's him grow- growing his harem and healing the world, kind of like every little bit. So it alternates. Um... In between, there is a lot of sex, but it's not overly graphic. I'd say it's just a touch past Showtime and its antics. Uh, Another nice touch that really made me appreciate the book 
was that the sex is actually a very necessary component for Mark to power up his enthralled. Um, he could juice them up. Um, sorry, that's a poor choice of, choice of words. Um, he could empower them via sex acts so that when the sex happens, there is at least a reason for it. It's not like he, he's driving down the road and he says, hey, honey, can, can we, we pull over? I need some sex. A line that I can tell you straight up has never worked on my wife when we had been on a road trip ever. Or when we've been in the kitchen or the living room or the dining room or the basement or the attic. Very rarely in the bedroom. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm digressing again. Anyway, um, so the sex isn't just thrown into the story, and, and that's something I can really appreciate. I, I can honestly say that even if you cut out every single sex scene in the book, the story would still hold up amazingly well. Uh, and you can't say that about all harem books, but at least here it adds to the story a lot. It's kind of like Gunmeister Online. Cool tale, excellent depictions, and it's integral to the story. Uh, you know, if you, you take it away, it's still a, a solid story, but it adds so much more. You know, in, in Gunmeister, you had to have sex with the guns in order to, A, keep them happy and bond them with you. And it had to be done periodically. It had to be updated. So you couldn't just, like, be like, bang, bang. You had to bang and then bang, bang. Um, and here, it's, it's pretty much the same way. You, you've got to power them up you know they, they can go out and fight on their own but they don't get their strength that they really really need until they're they're leveled up or powered up by you know the, the collector so you know mark does that with these characters and it works really nicely uh and and you can just kind of tell that prax likes anix the most which is fine um she's a cool character and i can kind of see the attraction to her i just don't dig for her so i'd skip her but um, yeah, I mean, he, he has his favorites, but overall the story works really well with the sex in it. Uh, and it was very enjoyable and, and I definitely want to see the next book and see where we go from there. Uh, there was a lot of stuff that happens in the book and there, there's also tragedy. I really love that, uh, he was very, very willing to wipe out an entire section of stuff that had occurred earlier in the book, um, just because. Uh, and you don't see that very often. And it, it was a nice way to kind of spur Mark and his companions uh, onward, so to speak. One thing that kind of drove me crazy was Christian Fox. Um, he, he just could not manage to say the word areolas properly. Now, you know, I'm not a prude, and I do know how to say the word areola, and I know what the word areola is. And he kept saying Aurelia's. Aurelius, and it kind of became an ear be for me. And you know what an earworm is, right? I mean, that's when you hear some catchy song and you just can't get it out of your head, you know? You know, um, so you just hear it once and it's like, boom, 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 It never goes away and it just drives you crazy all day. Well, an ear bee, in my opinion, um, is what happens when you hear something and it stings your ears every single time it is said. Sort of like how when the word ensigns was repeatedly referred to as ensigns in Warren, uh, Warden uh, Nova Online, th that drove me insane. It really did. I, I just was like, I just want to snap this book out and just quit because it was just so frustrating. Um, now, he does not say Aurelia's nearly as often as ensigns, um, but he does say it uh, you know, enough that it stood out to me and it kind of bugged me every single time. And every time that they were getting near this area of the women, I kind of got scared he was going to say Aurelia again. And so you'll, you'll see. Um, all I'm, I'm saying is, is if you're going to be narrating a book that clearly involves a lot of sex, you just might want to bone up on sexual terminology. Otherwise, he pretty much acquits himself fairly well. He was an above average narrator, but I wasn't stunned by his work. I think that given time, he could develop quite nicely. However... I have checked up on his resume, and he's done something like 120 books. And the majority of those involve some sort of naughty business in them, so I'm just wondering if Prax picked him for that reason specifically. And I have to wonder, if he's done that much, why does he have a hard time saying areolas? I even had to go make sure that I was reading it and saying it correctly all these years. And 
99.9% of every place that I looked at that said, can you pronounce this, said areolas, areolas, areolas. So I know it's not Aurelia's, okay? Just nope, 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 not Aurelia's. Uh, the book is a solid eight. Uh, it has a point, interesting characters, and a goal for the characters to reach. That is really essential to me. It wasn't just kind of wander around and have sex. Uh, that stuff drives me crazy. I, I, I just, I don't like slice of life so much. Uh, this was not slice of life. There was points to everything that happened in the book. The real questions here are how big will the harem become? Will any of them be killed by the antagonist? Hmm. And what will it take for Mark to get free and actually save the game world? Because he is stuck in game. So there's, there's reasons to come back and check out the next book. So just remember, you know, there is more to this story than just sex and harem stuff. There is there is actual lit things that happen, and it's an enjoyable book. So solid eight. Good job, Prax. So the next book we're going to do on our naughty list yet again is Lude Kingdom's Shadow's Edge, a high fantasy digital adventure. Written by Eden Red, narrated by Jane Tate, with a book length of nine hours and nine minutes. And that's rock solid time. Edric breathed a sigh of relief as he passed through the main gate of Lythor City. The guards stood at attention, eyeing him for a brief instant before turning their gaze to several more bodies just passing through. The sky turned dark amber as the setting sun painted the tops of towers and keeps in a dying light. The very air seemed to sigh as the sun continued to slip lower along the western horizon, a chilly comfort taking hold. Edric walked along, basking in the evening mood. Lanterns were hung from open windows, and the gentle touch of a flame on wicks glowed with a welcoming radiance. The player's back relaxed, and a small smile filled the edges of his mouth as citizens emerged for evening supper and drinks. The player was thankful to be safely behind city walls before night truly fell. Even in the Dragon Kingdoms, night was not a time for young adventurers. The world beyond civilization was cruel and unyielding. <coughs> So, Lude Kingdoms is, of all the books I'm re reviewing today, the one that pretty much just has sex in it for sex's sake. And I'm not saying that in a negative way at all. Uh, only that each book is different, and the sex, which if you haven't noticed by now, is, is there, all have different reasons for being in their respective books. So, since this is the naughty special, hmm, mm -hmm, naughty, I'm going to talk about the sexy stuff posted here first, and then dive right into the meat <clears throat> of the story. So, without any kind of, uh, you know, ado here, I'm just going to come right out and say, there is a lot of sex in this story. And that might be why the title has the word lewd in it. Just saying. Just saying. You know, it'd be kind of silly to have, like, you know, uh, one little uh, event, you know, maybe even a premature thing happened uh, in the story and call it a lewd tale. It's not. So the amount of sex is more expected and therefore not distracting to the tale at all. In fact, you, you kind of get to the point in life where you, you anticipate things happening, like sex, especially when you're reading a book or watching TV or a movie or something. And, and in this case, I'm not talking about like sex in a porno where the doorbell rings, ding dong, and the hot dog delivery guy shows up and suddenly realizes he's not only forgotten the hot dogs, but also the mustard, and he has to make it up to the sorority girls who were just about to have a hot dog eating contest. Wait, I really have to ask what kind of porn my son is watching. I mean, I caught him viewing this on his phone, and he said he was just doing it for research for culinary school. That's weird. That doesn't even sound like a, a normal porn. Anyway, uh, it doesn't have to have that kind of feel to it at all. But you do see it coming, and if you're an adult and you enjoy that sort of stuff, then you'll love the descriptive voice that is used. It's a lot like a jalapeno. It's, it's hot and spicy, but it only adds to the texture and flavor of the rest of the book. So you see, it isn't overwhelming, and it enhances the overarching tale. As for the story itself, it follows a cat named Edric Temple, who leads a life of adventure while trying to deal with war and building a kingdom. Now, this means life isn't easy, but it can be fun. 
There were several aspects that I really enjoyed, such as the city building itself. It sort of reminded me of Tamer, you know, where they're they're very slowly building a citadel as the harem grows, uh, or even Life Reset, where they build a village in the same vein as the original Warcraft game. But I, I never realized that I was so entranced by like this sort of stuff, like city building or, or town building. Um, and that was a real bonus for me because that was really where it clicked. You know, I, I listened to Life Reset uh, Part 2 recently, and, and I was just like, what is it about this book that I just love? You know, it was like, I just had to think about it and think about it. And here, Eden put it so easily forth that I was able to just kind of just say, ha ha, and realize that it was this building thing that she was doing that worked so nicely. It really fit and it worked well. I mean, I just enjoyed that aspect so much. Now, the story has a, a very nice pace to it and the characters are pretty well developed. Now, forgive me if I'm wrong on this. I only deal with audiobooks, so I'm not sure, but this book really feels like it's part of a, a, a bigger series, uh, and I, I don't know why we started here at this point, but I'm glad we did. Edric is a cool character and an MC that I don't mind following around. Sometimes the MCs, they're, they're not quite as interesting as we, we think they are, or hope they are, but this this one, he, he's a pretty cool guy to, to listen to and, and see where he goes. The story might cover a little bit of rough areas, just so you know. Like, there's some voyeuristic stuff with some possibly unwilling participants and maybe a few other things. But in the overall scheme of things, I don't find this to be nearly as strong as Fostering Faust. And I loved Fostering Faust. But I know some people took a lot of umbrage with it. So there are some things that could be a little bit iffy if you're, you know, a prude. Okay? Uh, and I'm not a prude, and I'm, I'm not a... a, a horny old guy. I do like to think I'm an adult and a grown-up, and that this sort of stuff can be discussed, you know, in a nice adult manner, and I think that, you know, sex is a integral part of life, and here, uh, it's used in just that capacity. Uh, even though there was a lot of sex, there wasn't a ton of focus on romance, okay? Sometimes the, the whole I love every woman in my harem thing stretches credulity, and sometimes it's just enough to have the hot dog delivery guy do his business and move along to the next house, that's in need of some wieners, you know, so you just kind of have to decide where you fall on that spectrum. Are, are you, you going to enjoy the sex? And, you know, 90% of people are going to say, hey, I'm harem. I'm all the way there. Uh, the other 90% of people that, you know, don't read harem are going to say, I don't want to do this because it's naughty. Well, I mean, naughtiness is, is, is not a problem if you're an adult and you treat it that way. So, like I say, the story has a nice plot, good pacing, cool characters, that only leads me to discuss the narration, and I have to say that Jane Tate does a nice job. What I really thought that she did well was to keep each sentence flowing right into the next, okay? She did not read this one sentence at a time like I so often hear. Uh, you know, one word at a time, one sentence at a time. Like they'll say, the cat went to the store, and the dog followed with the money. There's no, you know structure that keeps it moving it's, it's like one thing and one thing one thing rather than it all being a nice watery flow uh she does that really really well and that's something i don't see and especially since um this looks to be her first work she has a really pleasant voice and she uses it effectively um so i'm wondering if she's used an alias <coughs> excuse me so the only negative thing i have to say about her is that she does read a bit fast for me. Uh, she had the flow, but she needs to nail the pacing a little bit better. If this is her first book, though, man, I, I think she is going to be a really good force, to, you know, to to do narration later on. Uh, otherwise, startling solid work from a first-timer. I'm really surprised. Uh, my final score, again, I had to think on this because I didn't dislike anything from this story, and I thought it was a solid bit of work. I like Eden's style a lot. I think she can write a really good story and can write sex. And she, more importantly, can write a story with sex in it. Not everybody can do that last part, believe me. So my final score for the night is, you know, for, for here, um, is an eight star all the way. I, I would like to see some more of the older stuff of her, her, her earlier works hit the audible shelves in the future. So nice job, Eden. I really appreciated what you did here. Thank you. Well, believe it or not, this is not actually my spot loop, spot loop, spot loop, sound booth spotlight. How's that go? My gosh, it's not my sound booth spotlight for the night. 
but I'm going to be doing Cherry Blossom Girls 3, a superhero adventure by Harmon Cooper. It is narrated, oh my gosh, the narration, just listen to this cast. Justin Thomas James, Jeff Hayes, Lori Catherine Winkle, Annie Ellicott. My gosh, I mean, it's just that, there, there's enough there, believe me, they're, they're going to take care of it. And the book's length is 7 hours and 52 minutes. The bed was in the far corner, in practically another room, as was a chair to sit on and a tiny flat-screen television. There was something cruel about it, to be honest, like watching a hamster run on its wheel. But Michelle was cheery, and if she was depressed, she wasn't showing it in the way she greeted us. Her black hair with a pink stripe cutting through it partially covered her face, and she grinned from behind the dark strands. Is everyone ready to go? She asked, all gung-ho. I really like your outfits. He's not a super, right? You two clearly are. You two, punk rock lady. By the way, I'm Michelle. Dorian. Grace. Veronique. Uh, call me Gideon. And no, I'm not a super. What gave it away? I swear, everyone in the room raised an eyebrow at me. Rather than tell them I had a propensity for superpowers, I threw my thumb over my shoulder and said we should get to the next room. We continued down the hall, Adam in the lead and Veronique at the back, ready for anything. So, here we are, back again with book three of the CBGs, and the story just keeps rolling along nicely. Now, before I begin talking about the book, I do want to discuss a controversy I have long been saying is true. I honestly think Gideon, the main character of the Cherry Blossom Girls, was modeled after our intrepid narrator, Justin Thomas James. I mean, if you just look at them in a side-by-side -side comparison, there is simply no denying that Justin is Gideon. Uh, but both he and Cooper say nay, nay to that idea. You know, this is a naughty special, so I'm going to be, like, calling people out, okay? Uh, I say not only is Gideon based on Justin Thomas James, but so is the original G.I. Joe action figure. Just look at that side-by-side -side that I'm putting up right now. Look at that. That means that JTJ is a real American hero. <gasps> JTJ, a real American hero. But isn't he Canadian? I think he's Canadian. Aha, but he's North American, so he's still a real American hero. And that means JTJ, he'll fight for freedom whenever there's trouble. JTJ is there. JTJ, a real American hero. JTJ is there. All right. All right. Enough goofing around. And thanks, prop guy, because you were supposed to come in and help me here, but you didn't do it. He went to bed. You know, 2 o'clock in the morning, and he goes to bed. Who knows why? Right. So, like I said, it's cherry blossom time, and you should be very thankful that Harmon didn't name them the Apple Blossom Girls, or I would have been singing you the Andrew Sisters tune from the 40s rather than the G.I. Joe theme song. So book three pretty much picks up right where book two left off. And that's one of those things that I really enjoy about these series by Harmon Cooper. Um, there is no six weeks later, two months later, two days, you know. It's we left off here and boom, we're right where we left off at. And we right away get to see the squad has even more per participants show up uh, as Gideon picks up yet another angry hottie and three super teens. Uh, funny how quickly the harems grow once they get started, isn't it? Um, of course, trouble soon follows, as it inevitably, inevitably has to, and the ladies and the team are quickly forced to fight for their lives and their freedom. Freedom! Sorry, I just brave hearted out. But they got to fight for their freedom, they got to fight for their lives, and they've got to do some serious destroying of some evil facilities along the way. And that's one of those things that I do enjoy about this book as well, is that there is action, action, sex, action, action, sex, and, you know, it's not like one thing inevitably leads to another. It kind of happens organically. It's very organic. And um, I think one of my favorite parts to the book is the humor. Uh, I get Harmon Cooper's humor. I, I really do. It's it's like one of those things that I know when I read a Harmon Cooper book, I'm going to laugh out loud probably 10 times at some point, okay, depending on how much he puts into it. You know, like Quantum Hughes, I laugh at that cat all the time. Every time he says something, I practically burst out giggling like a little girl. Um, 
here, the book is really funny in a lot of points, and I found myself laughing a lot. Um, you know, one thing I did have to wonder about, though, was whether Harmon Cooper gave a nod to Lori Catherine Winkle with one of his comments. Um, if you ever get a chance to see, she stars in a video on YouTube called Road Head. Mm -hmm. And Gideon makes an offhanded comment that kind of says that, okay? And the connection is too funny. Even if it was unintentional, I still laugh myself stupid after I, I heard him do that because I said, this has to be a nod to Lori, okay? It just has to. Because if he ever saw that video, you know the, the whole thing is, is just this one big, long misery fest until the last section. And that, that right there, that was like the best, most funniest thing you get. It was so good. Um, even if it's unintentional, it's funny. But I don't think it was. I think it was a nod and a wink, okay? Um, you get that the book alternates between humorous bits and full-blown superhero battles with touches of sexiness sprinkled in. But I think my favorite funny bit was where Gideon was talking to his friend Luke in Canada. Hmm. Wonder who that's supposed to be. Um, I actually laughed so hard uh, that I, I went back and listened to it again because what they were doing was uh, they were discussing, like, author nicknames. And if you listen to them you, and, and you're any bit involved with the lit RPG community, you're going to know who the 90% of the people they're talking about was. And that was, like, one of the funniest parts to the whole book. I mean, just, like, the very start to the very end. Now, I only have to figure out a way to have convince Cooper to, you know, maybe have Gideon and Luke talk about an old fat guy who reviews, reviews audiobooks on their thing. I'd like to see that. Yeah, yeah, I think that'd be pretty cool. Are you listening, Harmon? I think you could pull that off, too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, I dare you. I dare you. Still, I kind of hope that you realize that I really get, hum you know, Cooper's humor. Um, the story carries forward just enough that I don't feel like it isn't going anywhere. Um, and as per usual, he gives us a big reveal at the end of the story. And he does that every single time in this series so far. This one, there is a huge reveal. Uh, and I have to say, it was really cool. And I was like, damn it, now I have to wait for the next book. There should be more, more. Um, I mean, uh, th this story just carries you, you through with this huge, this huge shock revelation. Um, he knows how to keep you interested. I'll say that. He keeps you interested in On Fleek. Even though I have to admit, I have no idea what that last part means. On Fleek? WTF, Millennials. WTF. What? On Fleek? Really? You got me speaking in letters, you know, WTF, and, but On Fleek? Really? I have no clue. It just sounds like something you guys say all the time. Uh, so there you go. Um, if you can't tell, I really love SBT, and I contemplated not doing two of their books uh, in one episode, but since I'm really going to be wasting a really good SBT spotlight for next week, I'll have to come up with another one. And, and But this was the naughty episode special. This was like, how could I not put the Cherry Blossom Girls in the naughty special? How could I not? Both of those books that are here tonight, the next one, which is our sound booth spotlight, Absolutely had to be in the naughty book category. I had to. So did this one. So I couldn't just say, yeah, I'll put the next one in next week and just wish it was in this one. No, you guys deserve it. And 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 so I did this. And all I can say is this is the definitive SBT team. The Audible Avengers have assembled once more to give us an amazing story. As always, their quality is beyond reproach. And they make this whole crazy story so believable. And, and, you know, you gotta you just got to have to give props because Lori and Annie, Lori and Annie can sound so sexy or so dangerous all in the same breath, all in the same breath, you know, and, and Justin, uh, you know, he, he does a really good job playing the everyman, you know, and, and what I love is the way he, he says it, you know, hey. I'm a guy who three weeks ago I uh, wasn't getting sex and you know was boring and now I'm living this crazy life and I love it. You know he really gives it that attitude that you would have if you were living Gideon's life, uh, and 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 that's where the whole thing with SBT comes into it. They they add so much into this, uh, you know, and I I know I praise them a lot and I am a huge Jeff Hayes fan. I'm a huge Spot Sound Booths fan. Uh, I love Lori Catherine Winkle and Annie Ellicott, and, and 
Justin Thomas James is just like, he is so up there on awesomeness. So, you know, no matter what I say here, it's just not going to be enough for me to get convey how good they do in this story. And, and I used to be like, why do we have to have four people doing this book? Really? I mean, you know, Jeff Hayes could do this all by himself. And I see now, you know, why he does this. I really do. I, I've kind of come across, he, he's beat me down. He's broken me. Uh, and SBT has done so just just through their sheer awesomeness, their experience, their their sheer um, talent uh, that made me realize, you know, you could have more than one person or two people at most do a story and have it still be amazing. So my final score is 8.1. Since the story, much like SM, S, MSE's Tamer series, gives us just enough of the taste of a bigger picture without moving forward so much. Um, I do appreciate that. that It does still keep going forward. I just, I just really need more of the book. Their books are too short. Uh, Either way, excellent book, excellent series, incredible writing, infectious humor, and intense audio work all combined to make something you don't want to miss. Seriously, go get this book. It's amazing. It's an incredible series. All right. So you've been wondering here it is, the sound booth spotlight for the week is Planet Kill! Planet Kill by Sebastian Wilde and Jamie Hawk. Narrated by Carly Crawford, Jeff Hayes, and Yvonne Sin. Who are they? New SBT people? Hmm. Now Jeff's getting naughty. Adding more ladies with a book length of 9 hours and 16 minutes. I'm ready to fight. He'll be there. Pierce said over comms. Just don't get caught with your pants down. I bet you'd like to see that. No thanks, I'm good. Dreg trekked around the shrubbery, looking for traps. He didn't find a thing. The place looked untouched, which struck him as a little strange. Then again, scavengers would have cleaned up after any battles. If Drag were being honest, it was just nice to be back on Planet Kill, where he could be himself. There were none of the restraints like back on Earth to hold him back. The fighter was free to act as he saw fit, regardless of the consequences. His quiet reflection was interrupted by a flurry of sharpened sticks, a quick duck and dodge to the left, and the spikes flew past without leaving even a scratch. Planet Kill is pretty much one of those books that makes no bones in regards to what it is about. This is an action-packed, shoot-em, screw-em, smoke-a-cigarette-style book. It doesn't pretend to be Shakespeare in a Park or a Hemingway machismo-filled tale of woe. This is a summer action flick from the 80s, minus the MPAA ratings, okay? In this flick, the action is cranked up to 11, and the sex is cranked up to 69. Yes, yes. This is a popcorn book, through and through. And the only thing I think Hayes missed doing was giving the character Trunk and Arnold schwarzenegger style voice, because that would have really fit the character. And I, and I think he, he just kind of didn't do it, just because, you know, you've got Mella over in the amazing Charles Dean's War Eternus stories. Um, but just a softer, you know, it doesn't have to be Cosmo and Wanda! It could have been Cosmo and Wanda. This is, you know, this is drunk. So we're going to go do... So, you know, yes, I just did Fairly Odd Parents. This is what it is when you are in your late 40s and you have kids who are 5, 7, and then you have other ones who have lived through the original runs of those shows who are now 17 and 15, respectively. You, you have watched every cartoon that was made in the last decade. And you will do the voices. So, either way, if you are a fan of blood, bullets, bombs, and BJs, mm -hmm, I went there, this book is for you. And no, I can't believe I just said that line. But it's true. But it's true. The book actually centers on two protagonists, one male and one female. Pierce, the male, is an agent who is seeking his wife, who he believes is kidnapped and taken to Planet Kill, which is a lot like a 24-hour Hunger Games program in which viewers can send tips or offer incentives for doing various deeds, ranging from assassination to ass blasting a nation. Oh, God help me. I can't not stop doing this. 
I just can't can't help myself. Um, in other words, this book kind of promotes various carnal actions for some cash. The players on Planet Kill can earn XP for performing these tasks, as well as some easy money. Cash allows you to buy or upgrade weapons and armor. You survive long enough on Planet Kill, and you are actually set for life. You get released, and you go out, and you live your life to the fullest with all the, the money you'd ever need. Um, you'll never want for anything again. Most people volunteer for it, but it seems that some have been volunteered against their will. So, you know, some volunteers are more equal than others, you know. Uh, it just looks that way. But most volunteer, um, that's just the way it goes. The other protagonist is Letha, a hardcore chick who knows her way around uh, <clears throat> and can handle anything that is thrown at her. She wants to kind of come off as hardcore, but she really cares about her people in a real way. I mean, it's not just like, you know, she's screwing people and, and sending them out to get killed. She actually cares about her people as opposed to most of the other warlords or whatever you want to consider her being, uh, who just, they, they could care less what happens to their people. Uh, and she is just doing what she can until she manages to earn enough XP and credits to get off the rock. Now, the book does, as I just said, rock back and forth between acts of violence and sex. Ah, sex and violence. What awesome music they make. You know what I'm saying? You know what I'm saying. How you doing? Yeah, how you doing? Yeah. Again, th that is what I like about this, This uh, is that there's a legitimate reason for the killing and the sex. These are all components that are actually integral, integral to the planet itself, and the players have no choice to but to get busy living or to get busy dying or just getting it on, uh, sometimes both at the same time. So it isn't just arbitrary acts of sex, like in some books where you have someone fight, have sex, fight, have sex, fight, have sex, have sex, have sex, and then fight again. There's a reason every time someone gets ganked, shanked, or spanked. And to me, that is really important. I don't need a Dear Penthouse letter, letter every time I get to a book. This is more of an HBO Unleashed with more sex and murder than every episode of Game of Thrones combined thus far. That means it was a fun and wild romp. It is also a harem book, but I guess with, with the character of Letha, um, I don't know having both men and women in her group, if that would count as a harem. I, I know there's a lot of debate in the harem community as to what constitutes a harem. Is a woman with a lot of men a reverse harem? Is it a harem? Is it something else? She's got both. So, you know, I'm going to call it a harem here just because. Uh, at best, it's a harem. At worst, it's a mixed harem book. Either way, fans of harems will be happy. Just be aware, not all of the harem people manage to survive at the end. And I love that. I love that she, you know, there people get killed. Uh, not everybody can survive all the way through a book. Uh, and that's one of the things I really enjoy about this book a lot. Uh, the book is called Planet Kill for a reason. And characters do die. And that's really a must. I would have liked to have seen even more bodies stacked, packed, and racked, along with having big racks by the end of the book. So, you know, it, it, it does what it's supposed to do. As for the narration, now let me get to here. We get not one, but two new members of the SBT team, Carly Crawford and Yvonne Sin. And at first, I was a little shocked and disappointed that neither Annie nor Lori was involved. But these two have really acquitted themselves superbly. They make a fine addition to the SBT squad, and I'm beginning to notice that Jeff might be building his own harem over there at Sound Booth. I'm just, just saying, if you guys look... It seems like there's a big, big harem going on. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Regardless of what Jeff is doing with his people, regardless, the stuff he's creating at SBT just keeps getting better and better. The sound effects are really expanding what can be done in the audio business. And I would love to see even more used. So keep it up, SBT team. You guys are planet killing it. What? I can't make a pun? I can't? Seriously? Buzz off. Come on. I'm just making a pun. There, but you guys are really knocking this stuff out of the park. Every single book, you guys do something new, something more innovative, or you add more things that you just don't expect. Here you've added new people plus the other stuff. This is a really, really good mix, and I really enjoyed this. Final score is 8.25, only because, and I mean this very deeply, 
I didn't like the split between the main MC's POVs. Try saying that five times real fast. I think either would have worked very well alone, but following one and then the other caused us to lose a little bit of story. Uh, and I think the bulk of the book should have been focused more on Letha, with periodic pieces focused on Pierce. By the way, I have to ask, just let me know, you know, Jamie Hawk or, you know, either one of you guys. Is Pierce an unintentional or an intentional porno name? I just have to ask. Just need to know. Okay. Either way, the book was excellent. You will enjoy it. 8.25 stars. I just think it was a fun, fun romp. And it's definitely a popcorn book. It's a summer, summer bonanza book. If you were watching movies, this would be an absolute summer blockbuster movie that came out uh, for your, you know, Michael Bay plus uh, who's who's a good, good, uh, I don't know, uh, Hugh Hefner. Michael Bay plus Hugh Hefner. That's probably bad. I would say Larry Flint. Michael Bay and Larry Flint got together and had a baby. It would be this book. Okay. Michael Bay and Larry Flint. It would be this book. So 8.25 stars. Keep on going with them, guys, because it's a good book. Oh, yeah, baby. The next book we're doing is Succubus by A.J. Markham, narrated by Iggy Toma, with a book length of 9 hours and 36 minutes. Oh, yeah. As I sat there in the headquarters of West Tech, Inc., I prayed to the video game gods for a break. I'd made it to the final round of interviews for a quality control position, and I desperately needed this. I'd been laid off from my previous job three months ago. My bank account was getting perilously low, and I was a month late on rent. Please, I beg, just this once, please let things go my way. Three mid-level managers were sitting across the table from me, looking at my resume. A guy in glasses, a brotastic dude from sales, and a woman from HR. I, of course, was putting on the best dog and pony show I possibly could. I've been playing Otherworld for years, even before you guys went to virtual reality. It's my favorite MMORPG ever. Sales guy loved what I was saying. Ian, yo, have you tried the full immersion unit yet, my man? Crap. I prayed my borderline poverty wasn't going to sink my chances. So, first of all, I just absolutely have to say, wow, this is one of the best books I've listened to in a long time that is not from a major author like Hunter, Corvin, or Dean. A.J. Markham has skillfully crafted a world that is rock solid and filled with interesting characters and actually has a message. He manages to paint vibrant scenes that are detailed and latch onto your senses. I mean, it's just incredible how good it is. And I know this is part of the naughty special, but I think this book actually belongs in a nice category of all the naughty books on the show today, I think that his sex scenes carry the most impact because they are not really sexy, but they are very sensual. There is more emotion involved there than there is physical pleasure, and that really only added to the story. Truth be told, there is not much sex in the book at all. I know we go several hours, several hours into the book before anything actually happens at all with real sex, okay? I mean, there might be some innuendos, or some, you know, peaks of stuff. But the actual act itself, you are a couple hours into the book. And then there are even only two real, you know, two or three real sex scenes in the whole book. And in in overall, I mean, you would think, hmm, there's a guy that can raise a succubus and, and the, the book is, is mature. So it's going to be all about sex. And it's not. It's not. Um, so... <laughs> you go all this time before the sex actually happens, and then there's not this overwhelming blast of sex. And when I talked to A.J. Markham about this book, he told me that someone had said that if it wasn't for the sex, they would have let their kids listen to it. And I totally have to agree. This is a novel that totally stands on its own without sex, but still employs sex in a way that completely elevates the story. You know, I just talked about Planet Kill and how in Planet Kill... It was a popcorn movie, and that's where the sex was because it was it was a purpose to it. And I talked about in <clears throat> in enthralled about how the sex was essential to empower you know the, the the women in the story so they could go out and do the fighting. Here, the sex um, totally 
elevates the story. It's not about just sex, sex, sex. And I, I wanted to record a segment. I mean, as soon as I was done listening to it, because I felt it was so powerful. This was really, really great stuff. I simply cannot praise this enough. I enjoyed this book immensely. So at this point, you're asking me, Ray, what the hell is this book about, man? Come on. Tell me. Well, okay, I'm going to tell you. Calm down. Because, yeah, I'm hyped up too. All right, okay. The story centers on a man who is in need of work and just happens to have a background that fits what the company he's applying at needs. Um, He's willing to be a human guinea pig. It seems Ian, the MC, has done some medical experimentation on himself in the past, and that makes him an ideal candidate candidate to go into this deep-dive, long-term, long-haul, immersive tank. And the OT is simply too good for him to pass up, and he starts instantly. I mean, they say, when are you willing to start? Five minutes ago, good, get in the tank. And he soon finds himself playing a warlock, a class that is made to summon demonic beings to do a bidding. And he is also saddled uh, with a by-the-numbers imp who takes every command he has given and interprets it to his benefit and Ian's detriment. Ian eventually summons a succubus named Alaria, who has a bad attitude and instantly crushes Ian's hope of ever having a love slave. Now, not only is all that in there, but he's also stuck in the game. Now, this isn't where, you know, one of those, well, I'm stuck in the game forever kind of things. This is... uh, I can't get out of the the immersive tube thing. I'm kind of trapped, so figure out what you guys need to do to get me out of here. Uh, basically, the story centers on ownership, free will, and slavery. But it does it in a really non-preachy way. In other words, it, it doesn't beat you over the head with it every five minutes. It, it, it is a very nice story about respect, how that respect is earned, as well as the fact that you can't force someone to love you. No matter how much power you have, and no matter whether you you summon them or not, you can't make it happen. Plus, I think it does a great job of showing how a guy will practically do anything to get laid. Again, this is an intensely fun book, and I really enjoyed myself listening to it. Wait, should I say I enjoyed myself while listening to it on the Naughty Special? I don't know. Don't take it the wrong way. I really just enjoyed the book. Okay? Now, another stellar thing about this novel is the incredible work by Iggy Toma. Now, I usually research new narrators just so I can see how experienced they are. I do this after I listen, not before, and I have to say I was really surprised at the books that he has done before because this is his first lit RPG book, and he reads this like a pro, an old hand. Uh, Another thing I shouldn't say on the Naughty Special. Anyway, he, he... He feels like he's been doing this for a really long time. He has it down. He knocks the voices out of the park. Seriously, this was like listening to Hayes, Padel, or Daniels. And all of you authors out there ought to take note because he owned this book from start to stop and made it a blast to listen to. All I know is if I had a book that was going to audio format soon, I would have this cat on my radar. I mean, like, I'm worried about nuclear bombs coming into the country radar. That solid is how good he is. He stole the show, which isn't easy to do with the high caliber of writing that was going on here. This guy really rocks, and he deserves to get into this genre. And I, for one, look forward to even more from him in the future. Um, but really, he's done a lot of uh, romancy stuff, uh, more than anything else. And I, I can see why he was chosen for this book, because I'm sure whoever, you know, over there... Uh, picks these these people out because it wasn't it wasn't um AJ Markham who picked him. Uh it was his his audio people. Uh they picked him out because he has a background in romance and they just assumed that this book was all about sex and it wasn't. And this cat fooled everybody. I mean he was like, oh yeah, I can do I can do sexy stuff. I can do that. I've been doing that for a long time. But guess what? I can not only do sexy stuff, I can do creepy sci-fi craziness that is in a fantasy realm, and make it all believable. He did. He did that. So, I mean, like I say, just just listen to Mark, my, you know, um, Toma as he does this, because he is really good. And I'm telling you now, guys, if I was a narrator, I'd be worried, because this guy's going to be stealing some, some business. He's going to be stealing some business. Now, I'm not going to fool around here. This book was totally captivating on every level. 
I love the premise, the characters, the goals, and the resolution at the ends. This, and I'm only going to say it once, and I'm going to be done with this. This is an 8.5 book, okay? 8.5 stars all the way. I could even go higher, but I just know I'm too hyped and too excited. Uh, and I don't want to allow, allow my craziness to interfere with my uh, overall perceptions. I want to be able to keep this as, as level-headed as possible. Um, but 8.5 stars, this was just incredible. And Toma and Markham are an incredible, incredible team. And I want the next book now. That's all I can tell you. I want the next book right now. All right. Well, now, this is another one of my segments. I've been doing a lot of Is It Lit, uh, RPG or not. And today, I'm going to be doing What Else Have They Done? Uh, and today, I'm going to be focused on Strange Magic, a uh, Yancey Lazarus no novel written by James Hunter, uh, narrated by Charlie Kevin. Uh, this is in the Yancey Lazarus series with a book length of 6 hours and 52 minutes, which was really nice uh, because it wasn't overly long and it was a nice, quick intro to the character. And you guys will really enjoy this. Piano keys bobbed and danced under the pressure of my fingers. Music, low, slow, and soulful, drifted through the club, merging and twirling with wandering clouds of blue-gray smoke. So many places have no smoking laws these days. Seems like there's nowhere in the country where a guy can take a drag from a cigarette in peace. Everyone is so worried about their health. They make damn sure you stay healthy by proxy. Not Nick's Smokehouse, though. Nick's like some rare, near-extinct animals, the kind of bar where you can die unmolested by laws or ordinances. You can burn yourself up with cancer, drown yourself into liver failure, or binge on a plate of ribs until a heart attack takes you cold, and no one will say boo. And you can die to music here, the beautiful, lonely, brassy beats of the like only ever found in New Orleans. So, I'm sure right now, if you've, if you've been watching this on YouTube, you're probably saying, Ray... You don't have your Santa hat on. You've had different Santa hats on throughout the entire show. Uh, where's your Santa hat? Well, being that this book is not really naughty, other than it's got some killing and things like that in it, I wanted to do something naughty myself. So I just happened to have some stupid old fat guy come to my door tonight asking for some donations. I had to take his head. That's right. I took care of Santa Claus. So any of them kids out there now, they, they need to know where Santa is. You tell him he's in my basement. There's the head. All right. So now I have to admit, all right, here, here's the deal. Here, here, here's, the, here's the whole thing. I came into this game late. I actually stumbled into Yancey Lazarus somewhere along the line of book five. And then I was backtracking my way through the series. Uh, this is what I like. I like urban fantasy at its finest. Lazarus is an interesting guy who gets caught up between a Scylla and Charybdis, more of a rock and a hard place. He has tough choices to make and even harder choices if he wants to stay one of the good guys. Yancey seems to be the type that, if left to his druthers, he would rather just bop from one gin joint to another making music and drinking. Uh, that being what it is, you know that's never going to happen. And soon enough, he comes into conflict with a tough and ends up on the lamb after making a killing in the back alley. And by that, I don't mean, make, mean he made a killing by playing dice. Yancey uses magic mana called the Viz to make his, his uh, magic come true. And he's a bit different because of it, because he ages slower than mere mortals, and most of his friends are older people that he really has known since or before or during the Vietnam War. He finds himself swept up in a battle between rival gangs with a nasty dark mage also being thrown into the mix, and his struggle to figure out who was behind everything is utterly entrancing. Um, you know, like I've said it before, this guy could stand shoulder to shoulder with some of the likes of like Harry Dresden, Nate Temple, Montague and Strong, and even Sandman Slim. Only here, to me, at least the characters and the action seems grittier and more down to earth than say like a Nate Temple story. I don't know if you guys have ever you know, read Nate Temple. Nate Temple was more, you know, off, it's, it's cheeky humor. Uh, it's not a, quite as serious. Uh, just like Harry Dresden. Dresden is, is a, a good character, but it's it's a lot of flippancy and, and nods to the, the to the reader. Um, here, we, you don't get that. I mean, it's, it's a good, solid story. It's pulpy noir, and it's something that as you go through, if you like those kind of series or things, 
this is going to be it for you. You're, you're going to read this and say, you know, this is a good starting point. You know, Yancey stands out in that department. Like I said, he could go toe-to-toe with Harry Dresden, I think, uh, by the, the time, you know, book six comes around. Uh, here we go with, you know, the way he does things. He, he, is, he is a soldier, so he has that aspect of things. He's always thinking like a soldier, doing things like a soldier. So he, he's got more of that kind of uh, mindset, you know, adapt, overcome, improvise. Those are his things that he does as he goes through life. Uh, he doesn't just sit back, but he reacts and he then um, implements things rather than waiting for things to happen to him. He, he's pretty slick, and I really enjoy that. Now, I do want to talk about Charlie Kevin for just a minute. Now, I, I really love his narration. It comes across as one of those old Philip Marlowe type of dialogues, and it adds that pulpy noir characteristic that really enhanced the story for me. He paints great verbal pictures. Uh, and he uses his voice to punctuate points when he needs to. It's a great style, and I think it's a great fit for the series. This is uh, much more obvious in, like, say, Book 5, where he seems really comfortable in the narration. And even James Marsters, who does do the Harry Dresden, you know, the Dresden Files readings, um, he kind of choked on the first two or three books before he actually kind of got into a nice rhythm and, and you really got to know the character and things. And because there were some points in book one alone where I was just like, I can't believe this guy is narrating uh, this story because it doesn't work. And I don't have that problem with Charlie Kevin. I think that his voice is really, really matched up well for the kind of story this is. Um, Kevin seems to fit the ground running, and I really appreciate that. And again, I want to say that this is read as if it was narrated by a noirish private dick. Yes, I said that on the Naughty Special. Someone like Sam Spade. So it might take some people unfamiliar with the cadence to get used to some time. You know, you, the way he talks, the way it's set. If, you, if you're not familiar with that kind of uh, dialogue and the way it's, it's done, it's kind of like iambic pentameter. It's going to sound weird to your ear if you've never heard it before. Um, and don't ask me to do that. I played Macduff a few times, but I don't want to try to go into iambic pentameter. It's just not... Not fun for me anymore. Um, so, you know, like I said, it could be a little unsettling, but to me, this was really, really a nice noir style. I love that stuff. I love it. I grew up watching all the old black and white, you know, Sam Spade movies, and I listened to Jolly Johnny Dollar on a radio, uh, Harry Lime types. I mean, th- this is just pure heaven for me, okay? From start to finish, this is my stew of life right here, uh, noir. So, you know, you get that pulp in there. Man, oh, man, this is just good stuff. Overall, and again, I'm going to just say I'm not rating the uh, the series that I do on what else have they done. This is my way of making you guys aware of these books that are out there that you may not look at because it's not lit or PG. And I think that the authors deserve, as well as the narrators deserve, to have some of their other works showcased and spotlighted just because. Uh, and so, again, this is a great way to start a series, uh, introduce a character, lay the groundwork for a cool setting and magic system. And I just want to say, give this book a try. You'll not regret it, not for one moment. No score, as I'm just trying to tell you about it, but I really like the series, and I think you understand, if I'm talking about the book, it's because I've enjoyed it. Uh, I'm never going to do a, what else have they done, and be like, God, this book was so bad. No, don't even come close to it. No, I'm never going to do that. Um, So just be aware, if I'm doing the, the, the what else have they done segment, it's a book I've enjoyed, okay? It's a book I've enjoyed a lot. So... Like I say, I'm not going to give scores to these anymore. I'm I'm just going to try and say, check out this series because it's well worth a look. The first book is really good, but it gets so much better as time goes on. And I know, you know, James Hunter has said he's going to, you know, be releasing more. So I'm eagerly waiting for the next installment of Yancey Lazarus because it's just a solid, solid piece of work. It's a great story. I love it. So you should enjoy it as well. Thank you. Well, everyone, that's our show. I'd like to thank you oh so very much for listening and watching. I do appreciate you taking the time to do that. Uh, So thank you so very much. If you want to support us, as always, I will reiterate uh, that you can like the Lit RPG audiobook 
podcast Facebook page or the YouTube page, or just share and like that video. I really sincerely hope that you've enjoyed our naughty special today and that all of you out there have a very, very happy holiday season, whether you follow Hanukkah, Christmas, Kwanzaa, whatever. It doesn't really matter. Just remember that this is a time for family and community sharing and love and happiness. And that's how I look at the Little RPG uh, community. We are very close-knit. We're very tight. I am even lucky to even consider that I'm a part of that community. Uh, I bless myself every day. I thank God that uh, I am a part of that community in, in some small fashion and and that uh, it is reciprocated that I'm there, that people say, hey, we, we, we think, you know, uh, you're, you're all right. So thank you so much for being there for me, guys. There's been times that uh, just, just going on Facebook and looking at some of the posts just has brought my spirits up. And I hope I do that with this show every now and then. I make somebody smile somewhere along the way. So please just uh, leave comments or suggestions in the com- uh, comment section below. Uh, feel free to tell me whatever you like. I do enjoy the feedback. Remember... You can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, iTunes, uh, Google Play, and Stitcher. For the Lit RPG Audiobook Podcast, I'm Ray. Merry Christmas. Keep listening.